So tonight, um, I was going to develop uh, how Bhante came upon his particular style of teaching meditation, how he developed Twim from his studies and from his own practice. Some of the material I'm going to cover is going to be a repetition of what I said this morning. But I was thinking about that and I thought, well, a um, professional tennis player, how many times does a professional tennis player repeat a serve? How many times does a professional pianist repeat the scales? How many times does a NFL quarterback and a wide receiver repeat the same route over and over again? So, um, so a twin teacher repeats the same material over and over again. And so that, so there. <laughs> And some of the material will be new, hopefully. Um, let me get my... So we're going to start reading from Majjhima Nikaya 119. The Kayag Kayagata Sati Sutta, Mindfulness of the Body. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in Savati in Jetas Grove, Anathampandikas Park. Now a number of bhikkhus were sitting in the assembly hall where they had met together in returning from their alms round after their meal when this discussion arose. It is wonderful, friends. <clears throat> it is mar <clears throat> marvelous how it has been said um, by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened, that mindfulness of the body when developed and cultivated is of great fruit and great benefit. However, their discussion was interrupted for the Blessed One rose from meditation when it was evening went to the assembly hall and sat down on a seat made ready. Then he addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, for what discussion are you sitting together here now? And what is your discussion that was interrupted? Here, venerable sir, we were sitting in the assembly hall where we had met together in returning from our alms round after our meal when this discussion arose among us. It is wonderful, friends. It is marvelous how it has been said by the Blessed One, who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened, that mindfulness of the body, when developed and cultivated, is of great fruit and great benefit. This was our discussion, Venerable Sir, that was interrupted when the Blessed One arrived. And how bhikkhus is mindfulness of the body developed and cultivated so that it is of great fruit and great benefit. Mindfulness of breathing. Here a bhikkhu gone to the forest or the root of a tree or to an empty hut sits down having folded his legs crosswise, sets his body erect and establishes mindfulness in front of him. Ever mindful he breathes in, mindful he breathes out. Breathing in long he understands I breathe in long 
for breathing out short. He understands I breathe out short. I breathe in short or breathing out short. Yeah, I repeated that. Um, he trains thus. And remember this morning I said whenever the suttas say trains, that means pay attention because this is a key to how you practice. He trains thus, I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body. He trains thus, I shall breathe out experiencing the whole body. He trains thus, I shall breathe in tranquilizing the bodily formations. He breathes, he trains thus, I shall breathe out tranquilizing the bodily formation. As he abides thus diligent, ardent, and resolute, his memories and intentions based on the household life are abandoned. With their abandoning, his mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness, and collected. That is how a bhikkhu develops mindfulness of the body. So that paragraph is found in several of the suttas that talk about mindfulness of the body. And when uh, Bhante Vimal Ramsey saw that paragraph and saw that when you breathe in, when you breathe out, you tranquilize your body. To him, it was a revelation. And it was a key that he discovered. So he had been doing the Pasana meditation on the breath since 1994. And this was 1996 when he found this precious key. Um, so um, he really paid attention to these instructions and he started um, doing his meditation according to these uh, training instructions. And um, his meditation practice changed dramatically, as I mentioned yesterday. And of course, he naturally progressed in the jhanas and experienced nirvana. And to reiterate, the tranquilizing step was the key. When he went back to Malaysia, he did not want to teach breath meditation with all the baggage from Vipassana practice. Um, he therefore turned his attention to teaching the Brahma Viharas, the divine abodes, metta, loving kindness, Karuna, compassion, mudita, altruistic joy, upeka, equanimity. So he used the same principles that were um, given in paying attention to the breath. He used the same principles in paying attention to the meditation object, which in the beginning is loving kindness. And again, um, when um, the mind strays, then he uses a tranquilizing step. And we've been using the tranquilizing step in order to let go of tightness and tension. Um, let's see. So then let's get back to the instructions once again. The meditation object is metta, a pleasant feeling in the center of the chest. This is, this is paying attention to the pleasant feeling in the body. So we establish mindfulness before us. In other words, we get the mind ready to observe how mind's attention moves from object to object. When the mind wanders as it has, over the last day, 
over and over again. It will often be um, in, in the beginning. With mindfulness, we recognize that the mind is not on the object of meditation anymore. So we release our attention from the distraction fully. Then we grow, go through the tranquilizing step, relaxing the body, softening any tension or tightness in the head, noticing that when this happens, tension and tightness and pain in other parts of the body also loosens up. One will notice that when one releases tension um, over time, the body adjusts its posture and it becomes more relaxed. So on a personal note, um, I wish I had known this tranquilizing step when I was doing my Vipassana meditation because um, oftentimes my body got very, very tense as I was following the breath. And often I struggled to push away the un unpleasant bodily feelings. Periodically I went into one-pointed concentration just to get some relief. And as I had said, that wasn't a very fruitful practice for me. So then after the relaxation step, we smile. Bhante discovered that smiling not only relaxes the face and head, but it is also uplifts the mind, promotes joy and lightness in the mind. Now with this wholesome uplifted mind, we return our attention to the object of meditation, a wholesome state. In this case, loving kindness for our, our um, spiritual friend, we make a wish May you be truly happy. Generate the pleasant, loving feeling in the heart space and keep the attention there as long as we can. So the mind will wander. And when the mind wanders by, with any distraction, a, no, a noise, an odor, a memory, a bodily feeling, re, we repeat the same process over and over and over again. The six R's, recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat, and let it just roll. So I will recapitulate in a different way. Using mindfulness, we recognize that mind has drifted from the object of meditation. Using right effort, we release attention on the distraction, tranquilize the bodily formations, relax and smile, bring up a wholesome state, metta, cultivate collectedness, collect the mind on the object as long as we can. So those are the last three folds of the eightfold path that I alluded to this morning. And that is the three folds of doing the meditation practice on the path. When Bhante came to realize with his direct knowledge, that is doing deep meditation, and he recognized what the Buddha said in Sutta MN149, these two things, serenity and insight, occur in him yoked evenly together. Serenity, collectedness, insight, mindfulness, yoked evenly together. So what does that mean, yoked evenly together? That means that in the beginning you start with your mindfulness and you collect the mind and it's rather superficial, there's a lot of static and a lot of noise. But you repeat that process, and as, the mi as your meditation practice deepens, the mindfulness gets sharper, the collectedness gets 
deeper and more silent. And so these two features evenly are yoked together all the way to Nibbana. This is a very unique perspective, I believe. Many other practices will do mindfulness now, uh, concentration now, and they don't yoke it together in the same fashion as TWIM. So I'm sure that the definitions for mindfulness and collectedness are deep in your awareness and in your memory, but mindfulness, remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from object to object, and collectedness, that even state, a state of balance, appropriate amount of energy in holding attention on the object of meditation. So let me turn to the suttas again to go over a description on the type of energy that we need to apply to our object of meditation. And that will be MN 128. Okay. So, um, so in this sutta, the Buddha talks to his disciples uh, about imperfections about distractions and hindrances. And he tells them that when he was just a bodhisattva, that he had these hindrances come up. And I will go over some of them after I give you this paragraph. Um, so he was addressing one of his followers, Anaruta, and he said, as Anuruddha, I was abiding diligent. I considered this, excess energy arose in me, and because of excess energy, my concentration, or collectedness, fell away. When my collectedness fell away, the light and the vision of forms disappeared. Suppose a man were to grip a quail tightly with both hands, it would die then and there. So too, an excess of energy arose in me. The light and the vision of forms disappeared. I considered this, I shall act that. In the future, excess of energy will not arise in me again. As Anuruddha, I was abiding diligent. I considered this. Deficiency of an energy arose in me, and because of deficiency of energy, my collectedness fell away. When my collectedness fell away, the light and the vision of forms disappeared. Suppose a man were to grip a quail loosely. It would fly out of his hands. So too a deficiency in energy arose in me, and light and the vision of forms disappeared. I considered thus, I will not um, have deficiency of energy, deficiency of energy will not arise in me again. Now that's easy for the Buddha to say, oh, I noticed this this um, distraction, and it will not arise in me again. <laughs> um, so, yes? What did they mean by light and the vision of forms? What did they mean by what? Light and the vision of forms. Well, the light and the vision of forms is a very deep state of, of meditation. Um, and I really, don't want to address that particular part right now, 
but we can talk about it in a little bit, okay? Um, the, the point that I wanted to make was about the energy. In the beginning, uh, the energy is all over the place. It's either too much or too little. And then as we get um, more deeply into our practice, the energy becomes more refined. And we have to remember to hold the object of meditation like we are holding a coil. Not too tight, because if it's too tight, then um, we'll go into one-pointed concentration. And if it's too loose, then a dis distraction will carry us away. So it's just the right amount to hold the, the object of meditation like a coil, very gently. Um, we'll get back to the vision of forms later. Okay. Uh, where are we? Okay, so then the um, list of, of um, hindrances that the Buddha had in this sutta were he did not have greed and hatred anymore because he was a bodhisattva at that time. So those uh, taints had been uh, overcome and extinguished. But he talked about doubt, inattention, sloth and torpor, fear, elation, excess energy and deficiency of energy, which is what I just uh, mentioned, longing, perception of diversity, and excess meditation upon forms. So those last two are quite deep in the meditation. We've gone over the basic five hindrances this morning. Uh, and let's see, I don't know if I really want to go over them again. <laughs> With, you might be tired of hearing about them. Um, Say what? It's okay to do it again. Do it again? Okay. We will try another, uh, running another route. <laughs> okay. I think that my flashlight is giving out. Um, Monty always explained that the hindrance the hindrances are our friends. And that's a very, very important point. Because in practices where people go into one-pointed one concentration, um, they suppress the hindrances. And while in that one-pointed concentration, they feel very good. But when they come out, the hindrances attack them just like they had never gone away and they're not extinguished and there is no personality development because of that so um so he said your hindrances are your friends invite them to tea and really get to know them they show us where we're attached and the progress in the jhanas and the personality de development depends on seeing and knowing these hindrances well over time and abandoning them. When that happens, insights arise and we make progress along the path of liberation. So for instance, for some reason, while sending loving kindness to a spiritual friend, the interest weakens and the mind has wandered to an unpleasant memory. Usually unpleasant memories tend to be more persistent and we tend to chew on them. 
trying to change them into something more pleasant. That is an attachment. She did me wrong. She misunderstood me. She was really nasty. I should have said this. I should have done that. Bringing up the alternative scenarios starts to make the experience more pleasant. So, oops, the mind has wandered from the object of meditation. My attention has wandered from the present moment. What to do? And I think I lost all of my... <laughs> where, where is everything? Oh my goodness. Okay, here we are. Mindfulness has kicked in and you recognize that the mind has wandered and then you go through the six R's again. If the attachment to the memory is strong, you will repeat the process over and over again. The distraction will weaken and eventually the mind will abandon it. When certain habits of thought are ingrained like a deep rut, the hindrance will arise again and again. But as you purify the mind and visit these unwholesome thoughts less frequently, these old thought ruts will start to fade. One day that hindrance will be gone. A feature of the hindrances is feeling attention and tightness in the mind and body. In the chain of dependent origination, which we will visit in in detail in the future. This tension is defined as craving. Craving is the step that comes after feeling. Each contact of the sense doors, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and thinking has a feeling. The feeling is pleasant, unpleasant, neither pleasant or unpleasant. In the example of the memory, the feeling was unpleasant. Right after feeling that feeling, we want to push it away. I want, I don't like that. There's tension and tightness that happens in the mind and body. This is craving, the beginning of identifying with the thought. How do we abandon that tension and tightness? We relax and soften and re-smile. That is the only effective way of purifying the mind of unwholesome states. Suppression will not do the job. That is just like, if you're trying to suppress, that is just like whack-a-mole. You whack it down here and it pops up over there. So that gentle relaxing and releasing eventually washes that hindrance away. Sometimes we try too hard to do all these steps and we feel worn out. So as I mentioned this morning, that is a good time to just laugh. <laughs> the laughter releases the tightness and tension and promotes letting go of the attachment. So as I mentioned this morning, um, you can do your laughing meditation when you're going on your um, meditation walk. Um, okay. When you continue keeping your attention on a hindrance, you are feeding it and making it bigger. By the same token, when you keep your attention on the object of meditation, a wholesome state, you're feeding it and making it grow. So what you do with what arises in the present moment dictates what arises in the future. So when an unwholesome state arises, you do your six R's and you bring up a wholesome state. And so you're, you're ignoring the unwholesome state by totally releasing that your attention on it and you're feeding the wholesome state. Don't blindly believe what I say. See it for yourself. Yeah. 
You are your own teacher. You are the one who really will investigate and know how your mind works, how the hindrances come into your mind, how you can let go of them, how you can develop the wholesome states, how you can purify your mind, how you can experience more happiness. So this is your investigation and this is your laboratory and you are your own teacher. The Buddha's words are really a guide and we're here to transmit that to you and help also.